want to look at the Word of God this evening. I'd like for you to open your scriptures to two passages, two texts tonight. The first passage is going to be found in 2 Peter chapter 1, in the reading of verses 2 and 3. And then we'll go to Romans chapter 1, verses 21 to 25. So we'll begin with 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. He says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according to as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Let's jump over to Romans and chapter 1. We'll connect these two as we a work through the sermon here this evening, Romans chapter 1, and, uh, and actually let's begin our reading here at verse 19, Romans 1, 19, because that which be made known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beast and to creeping things. Wherefore, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed or exchanged the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. Now, with that, let us pray. Father, we thank you that this evening we once again have uh, the privilege, the honor, and the duty to open up the Scriptures, to be able to read them, uh, rightly divide, and explain. And might it always be under the supervision, the jurisdiction, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit that His light will shed upon light so that we could see greater light from the Word about our Savior, about our God, and about our hearts. Teach us tonight, we pray, as we want to have our faith based upon your reality. You are genuine. You are there for us. And there are promises that you will keep. And as we uh, want to have our souls quieted, to be able to find a, a haven of rest in Jesus Christ as he promised to give us. So tonight on this little excursion in these texts of scriptures, uh, reveal to us, Lord, the sin in our lives and our belief systems, and at the same time, uh, prompt us and encourage and strengthen us to have an explicit faith and trust in who you are and all that is about you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as you can see by the title slide, on belief, the soy source of noise and on rest. It's picking up where we left off this morning, that when we speak about uh, Jesus said, come on to me, all you that are weary, that are windblown, uh, that are under heavy loads and, and suppressed by the weight and the burdens, that he said, you come on to me and I will, and learn of me and I will give you rest. And we pointed out that some of the the weariness and the, the heavy loads that we carry are the activity of our thoughts, the activity of our thought as we, we struggle with issues and matters and, and, uh, and, and things pertaining to life. And a lot of times those thoughts just keep moving on and on and on, and it gets to where the, the noise of thoughts in, uh, that are never going to be cleared away just seem to be louder and they will drown out the voice of God as he wants to present to us truth about himself. And so the struggle becomes then in uh, the, the noisiness of the soul oftentimes is related to the, our, our wanting to and our desire to use our own strategies or self-dependence or man's wisdom to try and unravel and solve some of life's most difficult problems. And so we had a list, a possible list. There might be fear and anxieties, discouragement, depression, 
and um, anger and resentment and bitterness and guilt and shame and, and sorrow and grief. These are all some of the things that uh, we, we deal with. We can have a, a disappointing day or a sudden tragedy or a sudden turn of events and these things that be, uh, just begin to possess our mind and, our, and in our thought process, we, we just kind of like wake up in the day thinking about it. We go to bed at night thinking about it. We, all day long, you can hear this noise in the background. And it's to us that struggle with this, Jesus extends this invitation that just come on to him and he promises to give us his kind of rest. And I want to just make clear that uh, th when you preach a sermon like that, it's almost like I, I use the illustration of reaching out, grabbing Saturn, and bring it down here to Earth so that we can take a look at it. Uh, the, sometimes those things, those kind of promises and truths uh, just seem to be like unrealistic concepts. But yet to think that would be to get into the very thing that we're going to be talking about tonight. That would be making a statement about God that is not true. When God makes explicit statements about himself that are true. And this becomes the struggle uh, that we sometimes have to deal with in our human hearts. Now before we get uh, too far down the road, there are two words that are going to be given to you tonight. One is called reality and the other is fantasy. We've used the word of reality several times on Wednesday night as it pertains to that which is real, obviously, because the root word of the, of the word reality is real. But to give it a Webster Dictionary definition, which we can fill it in with theology, it would be something like this, something that exists independently or ideas concerning it. It doesn't matter what anybody else says, it doesn't matter whether or not we have forensic proof of it, it doesn't matter uh, whether or not there is empirical evidence, the reality is something that exists independently uh, of ideas and or anything or anybody concerning it. That would be reality. So we could say that God is reality. We may not be able to see him, we may be not be able to feel him, we may not be able to measure his height, depth, width, or any of that, but it does not take away from the fact of the reality of God. We see the evidence of God. In Romans chapter 1, uh, the, uh, mankind knew of the reality of God, and so that was a truth. And they rejected that truth. Secondly, we'll, look th or we'll talk about Santa Claus. So now you understand fantasy. And uh, it's a, a supposition that is based on no solid foundation. And so we have myths and mythologies and stories and fairy tales. And in the sermon tonight, I'll use the illustration of Santa Claus, who is merely a fantasy. But the, but the reason is because these two stand in opposition of each other. And oftentimes as believers, we create and depend upon more fantasy, that which is not true, and that which has no foundation, no substance, and yet uh, there, are, there are Christians, believers, that will rest their case on these things, and they wonder why my life is so unstable. So um, let's continue to explore this a little bit further now. So there, we're going to break this sermon up into just three parts tonight. First, we're going to look at the, uh, the nature uh, excuse me, I, I must have clicked too far on that. The nature of truth. The nature of truth. The nature of truth basically is this. It is that which we might say uh, corresponds to reality. It corresponds to reality. So, going back to our, our second Peter passage, I want you to notice that when Peter speaks to us, he's, it, he's letting us know that, as, and we'll get back to this slide, but Peter is telling us that there is in some way, the noise problem in our soul is really related to a lack of knowledge about God and Jesus. Because we notice in verse 2, grace, peace multiplied through the knowledge of God. And then in verse 3, he says, his divine power has given us all things pertaining on the life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. So in, in those two verses, in that statement, whenever we are, are living life that is, lacks virtue or is filled with noise, lacks peace, and rather is replaced with a lot of restlessness, we would also acknowledge at this point that, it, that what we, there's something about the knowledge of God that we are lacking. Or it is a misconception about God. So we may have the knowledge of God, but we very well could have a misconception 
which in, truthfully is going to be, turn out to be fantasy. When we talk about uh, this nature of truth, now we go back to our Romans passage, because in the Romans passage, we, we find here uh, that there was, um, when it talks about God, there was something about God that man knew to be true. He did not have it in the written word. The Bible tells us in verse uh, 19 that the, that which was be made known of God was demonstrated in him, for God had showed it onto him. And so we have these invisible things that were clearly seen. They are understood that they are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that these people, all people, even to this day, are without excuse. So this, the nature of truth is that which man knows about God to be true. And there, the, the, this, uh, there were certain things that they knew about him that were to be true. Now, we know this because when we get up to verse 25, it tells us they exchanged the truth of God into a lie. Now, you cannot exchange something that you do not possess. So we have good, solid evidence that when it comes to truth, that these people of that time and even to this very day and age, even as Christians, we'll see later on, here's a principle that follows us, that it is possible to take what is known by man, the truth about God, and exchange it for that which is not true about God. And, and so we have this uh, thing happening right now. So what we have, that uh, they do know that there are certain things about them is true, but they would have to reject the truth in order to accept their own ideas, in order to propose their own ideas of what God should look like or how man should conduct himself. So when we take over that, this nature of truth, the first observation is this, then truth is that which corresponds to reality. Let me give you an example of we, what we mean by corresponds to reality as versus to fantasy. We all heard the Santa Claus story. We all know uh, that um, uh, we all know about the reindeer and, and Santa Claus jumping from house to house. The updated version of that was in a movie that was put out by Hallmark the last couple of days, and they were far more uh, cyber technical about it. He was able to travel at uh, light speed and go into different houses, and all the addresses were on a, uh, uh, an app, so to speak, on his phone, and all the L's were just all kinds of things that kind of ramped it up. Well, that makes a little bit more sense now, but we know uh, that that whole story about Santa Claus is a myth, and how do we know that? Because there are no witnesses. There was no substance. There are things that just cannot be true about the story. Uh, you can't take big fat men, put them down an eight inch tube. It's just not gonna work. And reindeer obviously do not fly because they're earthbound. And only the movies can make them gravitate into the air through a cabling system. However, children will buy into that story. And so that's a fantasy that after a while becomes a, a very vivid part of their life. On the other hand, when we look to Jesus, we find that he, there is reality there. There were witnesses. There was the story. There's all the evidence, both empirical evidence and circumstantial evidence and forensic evidence that proves that, that Jesus Christ was reality. So what is the difference between the two? That if children, all they do is grow up believing in Santa Claus, that because of believing in that fantasy, there is no substance, there's going to be a, a very unstable life. Which is true about anybody, that when you grow up and when you live life, and you believe in something that is not true, when you believe in a statement, a quote, truth about God that is not true, you're going to live a very unstable life, and one that will not give honor to God. On the other hand, you take a child that as he grows up with the story, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And then that, those, those verses, that close, those classic lines, are reinforced with biblical knowledge and supported and substantiated from the Scripture and from life. You are going to find that child is going to grow up and live his life 
on the terms of the reality of God's existence and the reality of what God says about himself, and there is going to be stability and probably a great service for God. You see the difference between the two. So the weakness of believing in things that are not true means instability, a lot of noise. And the benefit of believing in things that are true, especially about God, are those things that will create a stable life. Now, throw Santa Claus out. Let's just make God the common denominator because in the end, that's what all, this all boils down to. The Romans passage tells us that God is the common denominator here between uh, what is said there and what is said in 2 Peter. In other words, they knew the truth about God. They exchanged it for lies about God. 2 Peter tells us we have the, uh, the blessing of multiplied peace and the virtues of God given to us through the knowledge of God. The Romans passage speaks of men and people who, because of the, 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 uh, the truth is what corresponds to reality, are a people that would reject truth in exchange for a fantasy. And while well, the Second Peter passage speaks of a people who that receive truth and gain more knowledge of that truth about God and have multiplied blessings and, and the layers and laying on of layers of virtues. So our response to circumstances in life is, must be based upon reality. Let me say that again. Our response to circumstances in life must be based upon reality. What is true about God that he has revealed to us? Any situation that we run into, any struggle, any question, any matter of difficulty, those kind of circumstances must be based upon how we're going to treat them upon the reality of what is true about God. So you keep hearing me saying, making that statement, because we're going to look at some false statements about God that we, uh, just a few, that we may find ourselves saying are, are at times on our own. Secondly, nothing can be true and untrue at the same time. Nothing can be true and untrue at the same time. Now, let's just narrow that down to the uh, statements about God. It cannot be true that God cares and that he does not care at the same time. Let that roll around like a marble in a tin can for a little bit and let's see where that ends up. It cannot be true that God cares and that he does not care at the same time. So we say we have this knowledge, we understand that God cares he provides all of our needs. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And we have all of these things. Then there comes that moment in time when things just all of a sudden turned upside down. And you'll hear some, even the strongest believers make statements like this. God just doesn't love me. He doesn't care about me anymore. How could God do something like this, such a loving and kind God, to do those kinds of things, and people experience those kind of horrific events in their life? Does he truly, is he truly a loving God? Now, we can understand a non-believer making that statement and asking the question, but for a Christian, he puts himself in a precarious position. He puts himself in the position of Romans chapter 1, of exchanging the truth about God for a lie. And so we, we have to understand part of the nature of truth is this, as it pertains to God, nothing can be true about God and at the same time be untrue about God. So that means that we, we really have to capitalize on the things that the Bible says about Jesus Christ, about God himself, and hold fast to those things, even though the temptation is to insert untruths that become in our fantasies. In other words, there's nothing substantial there to support it. So that is the nature of truth. It will always correspond to reality. So anything that the scripture has to say is going to correspond to the reality of God, his existence, the revelation about himself, and nothing can be true and untrue at the same time. Meaning that only singular statements about God can be accepted. So let's look at the danger of unbelief. First off, belief is what you accept to, to be true. Now, that's pretty elementary, Sherlock, but yet we, we have to grasp this. 
Belief is what we accept to be true. So the danger is that uh, we can be, have a belief in something that is not true. So belief is what you accept to be true. The operative word there is the word accept. So we say that, that we have faith, we believe in something about God, it's we, what we accept to be true. Now then, talk about something not true about God, we might find ourselves at time believing in something that is not true about God. Therein lies the dilemma. And this is why we will end up with noisy hearts and souls, because we, we don't have anything to grasp, nothing to build our lives on. Nothing that answers the, the problems that we're dealing with. So you take, for example, the belief in Santa Claus is going, just going to lead to difficulties in making life work. Believing in false statements about God is just going to lead to more difficulties in attempting to make life work. Believing in that Jesus loves me, and as I said, with the child undergirded by the reality of God, what the Bible says, will bring about uh, a stable and useful life. So belief is what we accept to be true, and it's based upon reality, and so we get to a kind of like a sub-conclusion with this. Here's the point. We can believe in something about God or Santa Claus that is not true. So that's an either or, all right? But write this down. To the extent that your beliefs are grounded in reality, your life will have stability and will honor God. To the extent that your life is ground, rooted and grounded in reality, your beliefs that you have, to the extent that your beliefs are rooted in the substance and the promise of the Word of God, that reality, your life then is going to reflect stability, and it's one that will honor God. So how much emphasis and how much thought, how much preparation, how much digging and mining of uh, the promises of the Word of God and owning them and seeing them as genuine, irrevocable, irreversible promises to that extent that your beliefs are grounded in that kind of reality, your life will have stability. On the other hand, to the extent that your beliefs are grounded and rooted in fantasy, you will be an unstable individual, one that will on dishonor God. So in this case, we can say truly that if you follow the lineage, you follow the pattern of the Romans chapter 1 people, they had the knowledge of God, they understood who God was, they understood about God, but they exchanged that knowledge for a lie. And so their life became rooted in a fantasy, which brought about a disintegration of the entire human race. So that would be our first. Unbelief is rejecting what God says is true. Unbelief is taking what God says is true and, and then... Uh, rejecting that. I believe, um, we might say, uh, about our own ideas. Um, we have an, our ideas how God orders the world, what God says about himself. We can believe in that. For the most part, we do. Or we can believe in, uh, and, or we can believe in a system that is what we think God does in this world, and what we think and what we believe our ideas are about Him. So we can have an either or. As I mentioned this morning, if you have a belief that God is not always there when I need Him, or we, we create an idea uh, about God that is not a true statement from the Scripture, we have a, a, a rejection of things that He already has said clearly. And sometimes we, we, these things develop just through philosophy. They just develop through uh, ideas that try to answer uh, dilemmas and problems. Let me give you an example, an illustration. And uh, one of them would be just the whole idea of what is love. I mean, that's for the, for the believer, we can answer it, love is God. And make one clear, simple statement like that, and we'd like to go home. But then you have theologians that come along and they say, well, that's not necessarily true. How do we demonstrate love? 
And so as that moves forward, those theologians have to be able to take the, the biblical definition and the usage of the word love in the Scripture and give it new meaning that fits a, a uh, cultural context. So now, the, this new word meaning of love and its affections and its affiliations finds its way down now to human relationships. And in the world of human relationships, there's a biblical uh, view, worldview about what love is and the participants of love in particular ways. But when we bring in Rob Bell's definition of what love is, now it allows for uh, what we see much of today and that are the, that of the same-sex relationships and the redefinition of marriage. Because marriage involves what? Love. And if, if love is simply this, uh, uh, sacrificing one life for another, and if that is the blanket statement that covers all marital relationships, now we can dismiss the need for a heterosexual relationship. And, the, and that is why uh, the, the trend in the churches today is all making such a wide uh, berth for these kind of marriages, and they're not even arguing the point anymore. How did all that take place? Because the exchange of truth about God and his teaching and instruction clearly stated in the Scripture, clearly manifest to them, is exchanged for the lies about God, that God accepts all people of all lifestyles, and that the church should do likewise. So you understand how this works. We've taken biblical truth, we've turned it around, turned it into a fantasy, and the end result is instability in churches and in people's lives and a whole host of other problems. But it is that which people designed and what they believe, remember, belief is accepting that which is true, what you believe is true. And so here is this belief. They accept what they believe that which is true concerning definition of love, how it applies to human relationships, how it applies to marriage, how the church should act upon it, so forth and so on, as opposed to believing in what God says in the Bible about himself and what is true and the world that he has created. So here you, you just have some small illustration of how that actually works. See, the problem with unbelief, it has two problems. And so th th going back to my illustration, there's an unbelief of God's view on human sexual relationships. There's an unbelief in what God's word has to say about true agape love and where and when it is to be applied. It's just not a, anywhere you want to use an idea. In other words, you can't change the, the, the context uh, to fit the definition. The definition has to apply in the context. Simple hermeneutics. But nevertheless, what happens when we reject truth? There are two problems that arise out of that. Number one, rejecting truth is an insult about God himself. It's a high-handed insult about God, what he has to say about himself. So when you look at our passage, when they knew God, verse 21, and they did not glorify him nor were thankful, they became empty in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. The end result of that is in verse 25, they exchanged truth for a lie and what it goes on to say, uh, that, and they worship and serve the creature more than the creator. You go back to verse 23, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into the image made like unto corruptible man. What's the second point? It begins a process of your own disintegration. In other words, when you lower man, God down to human likeness, we have nothing more to live for, nothing, nobody to depend upon. It becomes a totally a man-centered man-dependent, man-driven strategy of how we're going to live life. And so that starts the, the downward spiral of humanity. That same concept is just as true in the believer's life. Now, in other words, if, if uh, we can have so much commotion and noise in our souls, 
And the only way to cure that problem, the only solution, is found in Jesus Christ. But see, that's a statement that Jesus made. It's our responsibility to unpack that. And so the, the knowledge of him, meekness and lowly, he has a yoke and he has a burden, but his, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. We begin to understand the definitions of that. And when we when you understand in a larger sense uh, the, the true statements about God, that gives us a, the belief system that is corresponds to reality, something that we can hold on to, whether it's uh, whether we like it or not, whether it doesn't seem to make sense or not, it's a true statement. But on the other hand, if we dismiss those true statements, well, I don't see how Jesus could ever give rest. He just doesn't understand the situation. Maybe he meant a different kind of rest. Maybe he didn't mean a, a rest for the soul. Maybe it was just a rest from the law. That's what it was. He was only speaking to the people that were trying to live up to the standards of the Pharisees. And it really doesn't have anything to do with a, the rest in the soul when it comes to the 21st century church. You see, here again, you can't have something that's true and untrue at the same time. It's either true that, God, that Jesus kept on to me and all people at all times, in all situations, and I will give you rest, or it is untrue that... He cannot do that, that it was limited to just a particular time and a period of people. But you can't have something as true and untrue at the same time, so one has to prevail over the other always. That's something just to keep in mind when it comes to some of the, the struggles that we go through. Look at the, what is our, our obligation in, in all of these matters, on these kind of things. Well, to, to try and draw this together, uh, this is something that you can find useful. And it's actually a statement, but I broke it down into smaller parts. I must labor to find out what is true according to God. I, get, I'm, I, I have to know, and we'll find out later on, that we really have to dig for this. I believe that all of us have a great knowledge about God and true statements. But the problem is, we may not have them so secured and anchored in our heart that the, the belief in the corresponds to reality, the reality is not really there. It's a concept, it is a statement, these are ideas, but at the same time, they, they, they don't serve as anchor points, as solidarity to the soul. So we have to find out what is true about God. I'm going to give you some verses to, uh, just to get the process started. Secondly, to repent of believing anything else, any other idea, any other notion, any other perspective that might offer as a substitute or an exchange to a genuine, realistic statement about God. We have to resolutely reject any deviation from, that's kind of a, um, to repent of believing anything else and then resolutely reject of any deviation from it. Now, by the way, going back to the repentance idea, it means just that. Uh, that um, and in, in some situations, it varies with people. It varies on uh, different situations. Let me give you an example. Um, we, you're going to find more and more situations where uh, because of the abortion industry, uh, the, the millennials that have gone through that and actually performed those kind of things, there's going to be a serious struggle on the, the biblical model of forgiveness. And their struggle is going to be whether they should forgive themselves or go, did God actually forgive me? And if God forgive me, how can I forgive myself? And this is where you're going to find some uh, statements about God that are not true are going to enter, the, enter into the, that kind of thinking. And they could be really devastating. God could never, because somebody's going to come along and say murder is an unpardonable sin. And uh, that, that can create a real serious struggle for that individual to the point where that's the noise in the soul. They can hear hundreds and hundreds of sermons, but when you get on the subject of forgiveness, it's just, not going to, it's just not going to cut the mustard. It's not going to break the ice. And so at this point, it would be a matter of, of repenting 
of believing anything else that says that God does not forgive. There has to be that repentance first. And it may not just be that subject. There's, there are many other situations where we have to repent of something that we believe about God that is not true. Then we have to resolutely reject uh, anything that, that deviates from what is true. Thirdly, we have to cling to the things that are true about God. This is where the work begins. Let me give you a couple of references. No matter what happens, to be able to cling to the things that are true about God. I give uh, You just go back to Job. There are a couple of verses that I think is well worth our reading. We already know the story about Job and, and what happened. So these verses now uh, will be, don't require a whole lot of exposition, but in chapter 1, verses 20 to 22. And the question remains, here is a man, if you want to talk about something that is really out there, you got to turn to Job. I, I, Paul is a terrific model in my life, and, and likewise with Job. And, it's, and when we make the statement to cling to the things that are true about God, no matter what happens to you, because a temptation is going to come in uh, the, to bring in the, the, a substitute, a lie, a fantasy. Well, in chapter 1, verse 20, Then Job arose, rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground, and worshiped, and said, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave statement of truth about God. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. It's just, he believed that about God. And so we would find in the rest of the story that he's able to survive the hardships and the circumstances and the testing that was set before him. Chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Then his wife said to him, Does thou retain thine integrity, curse God, and die? There is the proposition of something that is not true about God. Just curse God and die. He really doesn't care. He's not on your side. But he said unto her, Thou speakest one of the foolish women. Speakest what? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So here is a man that part of his integrity was that he would believe wholeheartedly in the truth that corresponded to the reality of God. He would not sit there double-minded and have something that was uh, the, with an attempt to have something that is true and not true about God at the same time. You, you can't have that. And so... He's, he knew the truth about God and the fact that God would never change. One more text is chapter 13 and verse 15. And here we read an answer once again as coming to him as he, uh, he speaks to Zophar, I think is the one at this point. But chapter 13, verse 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust him, but I will maintain my own ways before him. Even if this is what God is going to do to my life, whatever his purpose might be, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. He says, though he slay me, I will still trust him. Why? Because he knew and he embraced these truths about God. He is unchangeable. He is loving. He is care. He gives. He takes away. And so Job would rest his life on those truths. So what's at stake here? Well, it's not so much whether or not we get to manage situations or not, but truly, what is at stake? It's God's glory. You see, when you go back to the Romans passage in verse 21 of chapter 1, uh, we find uh, that they, ex they exchange the glory of God for that of the creature. And so the first thing that happens when we fall prey to uh, believing statements that are not true about God, falling prey to that kind of fantasy, we find ourselves in verse 21. Because that when we know God and we do not glorify Him as God, nor become thankful and our foolish hearts darkens, we change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. You will find that most of the times the suggestions or the propositions and, and the proposed ideas about God are going to be limited to the highest possibility of man, to the extent of man's reasoning and logic. 
So the things that come in that people propose as being true statements about God that really are not are those kinds of things that arise out of corruptible man and reject the glory of God. So what is at risk in all of that is unbelief robs God of his glory. And that is our first and primary calling in life. We are, as we study in Wednesday night, we are created for his glory. There are unique excellencies about God that we must always hang on to, that invisible reality that we may not be able to see, but we know through a heart of faith that is there. And once we begin that process of rejecting God and robbing him of his glory through exchange and substitution, it, we uh, end up uh, in a process of a downward spiral. We exchange the truth of God then for lies, and we begin to believe the lies. So here's the closing thoughts, and that would be this. If we want to bring stability, we have to have stabilizing truths about God. These, and what this means is that this is actually, you know, depending on the depths of your struggle, some of this may already have taken place, but there are just these five things. We, the first thing the Bible teaches us is that we must memorize these true statements. That means taking, uh, for example, you might take a topical index out of a Bible. What does it say about hope, faith, forgiveness, death, sorrow, sin, discouragement, and, and those kind of things? How does God answer those? Though so just any one of those topics, we would put at that particular verse to memory. Then we'd want to meditate. Timothy was told by Paul to meditate upon these things. So in that process of meditation, um, it is something that you, you, you just roll it around, you ask questions about it, you, how's it going to work out, and you, and you just begin thinking through, praying that the Holy Spirit would just help you and, and give you the wisdom on, on this, on that, on that particular subject. Truly, it is important to, that we fellowship with one another on these particular truths about God, whatever they might be. That means interaction. Just let me put a, uh, a plug-in for face-to-face, uh, one-on-one, people-to-people kind of fellowship. That's what makes a difference, as opposed to a third-world kind of fellowship, which is, you know, basically it's, it's social media. It, it just lacks the, the uh, human need for contact and seeing. Then you want to be able to test anything that stands in opposition to the, a truth about God. So Corinthians passage teaches us that we, we, uh, we test all those things that rise up against the knowledge of God. And we do all that we can to destroy and to pull down these, these kind of strongholds. Listen to preaching. 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 4. Paul would tell Timothy that in, in the midst of all of this uh, rejection of truth and, and, and so forth and so on, continue reading the Word and preach the Word in season and out. So that is the, the exercise on truths pertaining to God. Just to give you uh, one way to frame that out, for example, you could say God is always good, always we need that always part. We, we say that sometimes about certain things. This, this team is great. I mean, they are great. So we, we say it twice to reinforce and get the point across. So God is always good. And then I have a list there of just some basic, not all, it's, it's not uh, uh, the whole volume of verses that pertain to this, just this one idea. But we can say that he genuinely will always meet our need, Matthew 6, 31 to 33. So with uh, food and raiment there before be content, God promises that uh, as he took care of lilies and, and flowers and birds of the air and so forth, he'll make sure that we are fully clothed and have all that we need. Philippians 4, 13 to 19 speaks about 
uh, Paul says, and God shall supply all my need through his, his promises. God uh, always, in his goodness, he always forgives my sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse from all the righteous, always. God is always up to something good. Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, uh, I know my thoughts towards you, thoughts of, and he tells what he plans to do with his people. God is always, Romans 8, 28, forward speaks of that. God always loves me personally. Who can separate us from the love of God? Neither height, nor depth, nor adversary. And he creates that list given in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. So what is the, the purpose of this exercise? I, I hope it wasn't too complex. Because the whole subject deals with noisy souls. And the noisy heart fails to attach itself to truth concerning God, stabilizing truth. And so without that stability of those truths that, can, that we have something to hang on to, we'll never be able to fully receive and accept the statement that Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that are tossed and turned and weary, and I will give you rest. We'll never be able to believe that because we, without stability of acknowledging and holding on to truth, we're going to find ourselves susceptible to statements about God that are not true. And they will become the prevailing winds of the human heart. And then when Jesus comes along with a statement like that, it's like, that's just, I don't think so. How is that possible? Well, part of the way it is possible, fact this has to become something purposeful in our lives, is that it takes work. It does take work. We have to mind this out. And uh, in our microwave, quick and easy, app-driven world in which we live, that's, that is far-fetched from the way we used to do it in the old days. And so if we, instead of memorizing verses, we swipe them, and they show up right there. But that's going to another sermon at another time, but I'm, I just want you to know that um, w when with, with noise and on restlessness and struggles, uh, the fix is not when everybody goes back to square one the way it was. Jesus says, with all of that weariness, I can help take away the noise and give you the rest, a quiet heart. And that's what we're looking for. So, Father, we, we do pray that in this we would understand our duty. Jesus did say that there was a yoke that we would share with him. My yoke is easy and that his burden is light. So we're not going to be able to just walk out of this scot-free and say, all of a sudden that you will just miraculously change our hearts. The yoke implies that there will be some labor, some work, some pulling. But yet we're not in it alone. Because we have him beside us, the other side of the yoke, the two pulling the same plow. And the implications behind that, Father, are just, uh, just breathtaking. And so we ask that you'd help us to meditate upon those kind of things, see our duty in this. And we would do pray that you would give us restful spirits. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.